Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I hope today's program brings you some insightful information on how and when workers' compensation and employment law intersect. My name is Lorena Vasquez. I have my own law practice, Vasquez Law, where I focus on plaintiff's employment law and personal injury. I'm happy to bring this program on behalf of the Beverly Hills Bar Association Labor and Employment Section. Today's program will explore the intersection between employment law and workers' compensation. After this program, you will receive an email from BHBA with your MCLE certificate. If we have time at the end, we'll hold that for questioning. I'm honored to host this amazing group of panelists that I will now briefly introduce. Our first speaker is Ileana Guzman Castro, a shareholder at Hermerson Guzman and Wang, a leading workers' compensation defense firm. Ms. Castro has successfully provided workers' compensation representation to insurance carriers and their employers. Our second speaker is Janet Arias, partner of Blanco and Arias. Ms. Arias handles cases involving wrongful termination, retaliation, unlawful discrimination, harassment due to race, gender, disability, and other protected categories. Janet Arias also handles matters involving applicant workers' compensation, wage and hour, and personal injury. Prior to founding her own firm, Ms. Arias worked on the defense side on workers' compensation claims and employment matters. Our third speaker is Nikki Stagg, an associate at Old Fifth Tree and Zinkins. Ms. Stagg defends employers in single plaintiff legal actions filed in state and federal court. She has experience defending employers against claims of discrimination, harassment, retaliation, wrongful termination, unfair business practices, and wage and hour violations. She counsels clients on proactive measures in order to avoid litigation, provides training on employment-related topics, including sexual harassment, and reviews employer policies and handbooks for compliance. We will get started with Ileana, who will give us an overview of the workers' compensation system and 132A claims. Take it away, Ileana. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to be here, and uh, like Lorena, Thank you. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I've been practicing workers' compensation defense for approximately 10 years now and um, have experience handling all aspects of workers' compensation cases from the defense perspective. So without further ado, let's get started. Workers' compensation overview and labor code 132A claims. So just a general overview. Next slide, please. So the workers' compensation claim process, it's the sole and exclusive remedy for work-related injuries regardless, regardless of employer's fault. So what does that mean? Essentially, it doesn't matter if the it's it doesn't matter if the employer if it's the employer's fault. It's that's the exclusive remedy. It's a benefit giving system and it favors, let's truth be told, it does favor the applicant. So if an employee slips and falls at work and no third party was involved, that's the key here, no third party was involved, the employee's only remedy is to file a workers' compensation claim and an application for adjudication of claim with the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board. So in regards to remedies, what is it that your client will be receiving uh, if the claim initially if the claim is accepted. So while they're off of work and a doctor is certifying them for losing time, meaning they're not able to go back to work, they're entitled to temporary disability indemnity benefits. That's two thirds of their average weekly wages. Once they are discharged from care and released to go back to work, whether it's with some work restrictions or no work restrictions, they're entitled to permanent disability indemnity. And that's just the value in best terms, what's the value of their injury? Um, next slide, please. So third party liability. What if the employee was injured at work and it's, result, and it's as a result of a third party? So for example, um, your client works at a recycling company where uh, clients come in and drop off their recyclables, their cans of soda, et cetera. And uh, your client, while he was on the job, um, another uh, a 
individual who comes in to drop off the recyclables backs into your client. It happened on the job, but your client also now has a remedy to file a case in superior court and to go against that third party. So when you get uh, cases, you wanna be careful to analyze them to ensure that uh, you're not filing a civil suit where one is not applicable. And that recently happened, uh, the years that I've been practicing, that recently just happened. Uh, an injured worker slipped and fell on the job uh, and she went and retained an attorney and her attorneys filed a civil suit in superior court. It happened on the job. She doesn't have a remedy in superior court. She then went and hired another attorney. That attorney analyzed the case correctly and filed an application for adjudication of claim at the workers with the workers compensation appeals board. Um, and uh, this is when you wanna get as much information from your client because at the time that we were at the deposition, he hadn't realized that she had filed a civil suit until I told him and made him aware of it. Uh, so you wanna be careful in analyzing all of those, uh, uh, analyzing your case, anal you know, speaking to your client and trying to get as much information from them. Okay, next slide. So your client files a claim, uh, you file an application for adjudication of claim, on their behalf at the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, your client gets fired or their hours get reduced, or maybe they get passed over for a promotion. What next? Next slide, please. So you wanna analyze it, you know, before you file a 132A claim as well and do the necessary discovery was it a mass layoff? Was it, uh, you know, is there a legitimate business reason for this? But let's look at the labor code first. So labor code 132A, it prohibits employers from taking adverse action against an employee who suffers a workplace injury or who files a workers' compensation claim. So you cannot just charge an employee for submitting a work comp claim, filing an application, the intent to file an application, settling a work comp claim, or if the matter proceeds to, to a trial, obtaining an award. Next slide, please. So if we look at the language of 132A, here it says an employer who discharges or threatens to discharge or in any matter discriminates against an employee because he or she has filed or made known an intention to file, there's the intention, uh, an application with the appeals board is guilty of a misdemeanor and in such cases, the benefits can be increased by one half. However, they are capped at $10,000 plus costs not to exceed $250. The practice point here also is look at your statute of limitations. You have one year from the date of the discriminatory act or from the date of termination of the employee. The date of termination is the date of the actual term, uh, termination rather than the date of the notice of termination. So like I said, doing the discovery, you wanna make sure that um, at least, you know, that I would look at from uh, representing an injured worker, I would make sure that there is not a legitimate business reason for, uh, for the action. Uh, then also that there's also, um, you know, is he part of a mass or she part of a mass layoff? Uh, were there prior written warnings that, you know, would have been a basis for not promoting them uh, or for not getting a wage increase? Uh, th that is discovery that I would recommend to be done during uh, the claim process. And how do you do that? I would probably subpoena the employer's records, subpoena the insurance claim file. Um, also see if you can get any witnesses from the, uh, on the employer's side, any coworkers, if anyone's willing to talk to you in that regard. Uh, next slide. So what are the remedies? As mentioned, it's the $10,000 cap. Next slide uh, for increase in benefits. 
and costs not to exceed $250, but the board also has equitable powers to make the applicant whole. So that can include reinstating the former employer or finding that the employees also owed lost wages if the lost wages are deemed to be the result of the discriminatory act in that regard. Um, that is the extent as far as my presentation goes, but we can get into it at later because I believe we're gonna have Q&A at the end of uh, the presentation. And I do believe some questions have come up, but they may be answered during possibly Jeanette's presentation or Nikki's. Thank you, Ileana. Next, we have Jeanette Arias, who will explain how workers' comp and FIHA intersect. Thank you, Jeanette. You're muted. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so what happens with um, workers' compensation and employment cases and FIHA? A lot of these workers' compensation cases end up turning into an employment FIHA, FIHA case, employment disability discrimination, or uh, wrongful termination cases. So why does that happen? And that's where the intersection between workers' compensation and employment happen. So uh, next slide. So um, you have an employee that suffers a work-related injury and they go off on disability. Once they get returned to work by their doctor, uh, the doctor issues a report. The report makes it to the employer and the adjuster. If the employer notifies the adjuster that there's no, uh, no work for the employee that accommodates those duties, the employer a lot of times will issue what's called a, a job displacement voucher that says that the injured worker is no longer qualified to do their job. However, that does not relieve the employer of their obligation to engage in a good faith interactive process. And that's labor code section. Um, and the, the, the adjuster can, um, can satisfy their obligation under labor code 4658.7. However, it does not relieve the employer's obligation under FIHA. Next slide. So what does this mean? This means that uh, pursuant to government code section 1294N, it is, un it is unlawful employment practice for an employer to fail to engage in a timely good faith interactive process with the employee or applicant to determine effective reasonable accommodations, if any, in response to a request for reasonable accommodations by an employee or applicant with known physical or mental disability or known medical condition. What does this mean? This means that FIHA requires the employer to engage in a formal dialogue with uh, disabled employees. How does this interplay with workers' compensation? The employee has an injury. The employee goes to their uh, qualified medical evaluator um, and it gets released back to work with restrictions. So what does this mean? This means that the adjuster will send the report to the employer. And at that moment, the employer is required to engage in this formal dialogue. Whether or not they have uh, accommodations, that's, that's, the, that's the dialogue that has to happen with the employee. This is where a lot of employers fail and violate FIHA because they will they will just let the adjuster know that there's no accommodations and the adjuster will send out their, the supplemental job displacement voucher and essentially the employee is terminated. Next, next slide. So the in, interactive process is a mandatory obligation for the employers, which requires communication and the good faith exploration of possible accommodations. So here's, here's a scenario that is very, very typical in workers' compensation. Once the employee starts treating, they may or may not be returned to work with modified duties. They, if they are returned with modified duties by the primary, primary treating physician, the employer is obligated to engage in a good faith interactive process every single time that that work status comes in and there's a change in restrictions. So once the employee is released to work from work from the, P, from the primary treating physician and then goes to the QME, the qualified medical evaluator, and again gets returned to work with modified work restrictions or permanent work restrictions, the employer has a continuing duty to engage in that good faith interactive process. 
So again, um, next slide. Like I said, that, that uh, interactive process is an ongoing duty um, that the employer has. And this is where the, again, where, where the employer fails because they may get multiple reports and they may do one interactive process, but then fail to do the remaining one of them, even though the restrictions have changed. Um, one other thing that's also a, a reasonable accommodation is extending their leave, giving them additional time to recover from that industrial injury. Now, a lot of times you will also have employees or injured workers be returned back to work with 0% permanent disability. That means that there's no impairment that resulted as a result of their, of their industrial injury and will be returned back to work without any mo modified work duties and back to regular duty. However, a lot of times the employer regards them as being disabled and will not engage in a good faith interactive process. The law also requires the employer to engage in a good faith interactive process, even with those employees that do not have a disability but are regarded to be disabled. So that's one really important thing that um, also happens in workers' compensation. The employee gets returned to work with zero impairment and the employer continues to fail to engage in a good faith interactive process and then eventually ends up releasing or terminating the employee without engaging in that interactive process. Next slide. Um, so once, once the, what is the purpose of the good faith interactive process? Uh, to determine whether there are any reasonable accommodations that this injured worker can have. How can that injury, how can those modified work duties can be uh, accommodated? Next slide. So according to government code section 12940, it is, unlawful, it is an unlawful employment practice to fail to make a reasonable accommodation for known physical or mental disability of an employee, unless the employer demonstrates that doing so would impose an undue hardship. For example, they are the only uh, person um, in that position and no one else, and they cannot possibly do that, uh, their essential job functions with accommodation. For example, they are the only person that lifts 50 pounds and uh, the injured worker has a five pound lifting requirement and there's no way that they can, you know, continue doing business without having that one person lift 50 pounds. Um, so as long as they demonstrate that they would impose, uh, it would impose an undue hardship, then they would not need to uh, provide those accommodations. But Nikki will go over that a little uh, later. So um, failing to accommodate um, is a, it's, it's a cause of action in and of itself. And the elements are the plaintiff had a disability covered under FIHA. The plaintiff is a qualified individual, meaning he can perform his essential job functions of the position. And three, the employer failed to reasonably accommodate that plaintiff. Next slide. So what I wanna do now is, um, next slide is I wanna go through a quick hypothetical of how this um, constantly happens and how workers' compensation cases turn into employment, uh, disability, uh, discrimination, failure to accommodate and retaliation and wrongful termination cases. You have an, in, uh, an employee that has a, um, a very physical type of job. Um, let's say they are uh, uh, loading trucks and they have a back injury. They start, uh, they, um, they report the injury to HR. HR refers them to uh, workers' comp, uh, to fill out a form for workers' compensation. They start treating. Uh, their primary treating doctor releases them back to work with modified duties and the employer sends them back to work and starts, they start sweeping uh, the floor. That's something that they're able to uh, do within the restrictions. Uh, the restrictions are no lifting more than 10 pounds and the employee is able to continue working. At some point, the uh, employee goes back to their doctor, the primary treating physician, and the doctor changes the, the restrictions to uh, no lifting more than five pounds and no standing longer than 
uh, 20 minutes every hour. At that point, the employer is not able to accommodate anymore, but instead of having a discussion with the, with the injured worker, they just notify the, uh, the adjuster that there's no available positions at the time. The adjuster, uh, the adjuster starts paying temporary disability because they are disabled. However, that still does not relieve the employer's duty to engage in a good faith interactive process. They have complied with the workers' compensation laws by, play, paying, um, by paying temporary disability, but the employer still has to engage in that good faith interactive process. The employee continues to be on modified work duties and then goes to the QME, the Qualified Medical Evaluator. Now the employee gets released back to work with permanent restrictions of no lifting more than 50 pounds and that's the only restriction. At that point, the, the, uh, the adjuster sends the, that portion of the report to the employer. And at that time, the employer has to engage in a good faith interactive process. If they don't, that is a FIFA violation. This is where a lot of workers' compensation cases turn into employment cases. The, as soon as the adjuster sends the uh, report to the employer and the employer responds, there's nothing available, the employer, the, I'm sorry, the um, claims adjuster will send that supplemental job displacement voucher, which is what they're required to do under workers' compensation. But the employer will fail to engage in the good faith interactive process. So what happened, next, uh, next slide. So under workers' compensation law, the, if the employer does not have regular or modified or alternate work for the employee to return to the workplace and the employer does not return the employee, so long as the carrier starts paying the permanent disability benefits that Ileana talked about and issues that supplemental job displacement voucher, there's no violation of workers' compensation law. But this is where the FICA violation occurs because the employer will not do anything after that. And um, there is an incentive for the, uh, the claims adjuster to, that the employee is, there is an incentive for the claims adjuster um, when the employee is no longer employed because that guarantees a compromise and release as opposed to a stipulated award. The stipulated award just uh, pays for the um, the permanent disability and leaves the the um, the future medical care open. However, a compromise and release completely settles the case. So, where does this get the the um, the employer in trouble, and where does it, and how does this get the um, the claims adjuster um, in trouble? A lot of times, the claims adjuster will tell the employers that it's okay to let go of the employee if there's no um, if there's no modified work or they can't accommodate. However, if the employer does not engage in that good faith interactive process, that is the FICA violation. Um, when I was a defense attorney, a workers compensation defense attorney, I had a lot of employers um, ask me, can I terminate them, right? And um, so this will happen. And the employers will also ask the, um, the claims adjuster whether they can terminate them if there's no position. The claims adjusters, because they do have an incentive to close out these cases, sometimes will tell them that it's okay to terminate them. Um, and you know, obviously that's wrong because they should be consulting with an attorney to make sure that they are complying with FIHA, but this does occur very often. Um, so recently, um, next, how much time do I have? Sorry. Okay, um, next, You're good. Uh, okay. next, um, next uh, slide, thank you. Okay, so what happens when the employee gets terminated without um, also engaging in that good faith interactive process? We can also have a retaliation claim. We can have an, a retaliation claim because um, we can make that argument that they were retaliated against for requesting those reasonable accommodations. They did get, uh, the employer did get the request for accommodation, whether it was from the employee themselves or the doctor's office or the claims adjuster. Um, they, um, the employer was on notice of those work restrictions. Uh, next, next slide. So the, next slide. So retaliation, um, 
the elements for retaliation, he or she engaged in a protected activity, which was requesting accommodations. The employer subjected him or her to an adverse employment action. They were terminated, demoted, um, et cetera. And there is a, a causal link between the protected activity and the employer's action. So after the employee requests reasonable accommodations, they get terminated. So I see it very, very often. The majority of my cases stem from workers' compensation. Um, it's very common for the employers to terminate an employee after filing the workers' compensation claim and or after requesting accommodations. Um, like I said, sometimes the adjusters will tell employers that it's okay to let go of an employee if there's no modified work available. Um, next slide. So going back to when the adjusters have an incentive to close out these cases by um, um, have an incentive to close out these cases by way of compromise and release. Why? Because their numbers are better. They have certain quotas. So recently, um, um, an employment attorney up in Northern California, they tried a case against a third party administrator and there was a jury verdict of um, $34.5 million that included punitives and emotional distress. And this actually stemmed after the TPA um, altered some of the PQME reports so that the employer would believe that the restrictions were actually more restrictive than um, what they were, that what they were, what they were actually. Um, so what happens is the uh, adjuster has an incentive to close out these cases by compromise and release. When the employee is still employed, um, rarely are there going to be any compromise and releases um, uh, with a return to work. It's going to be a uh, stipulated award, a award with, um, and um, the claim will remain open potentially for the rest of their lives because workers' compensation does entitle the employee employee to lifetime medical treatment. So these the adjusters will provide the wrong information to to uh, the employer sometimes, but that also subjects the employer to liability if they do not follow proper FIHA procedures. So like Ileana was mentioning, um, the injured worker has the uh, remedy of 132A if they are terminated. However, it's, there's also the FIHA remedy, which is in civil. And um, under FIHA, they also get awarded um, emotional distress damages and can also be awarded um, attorney fees. So I typically do not file, do not really litigate the 132As. I will file the 132A sometimes to do initial discovery and they would kind of um, uh, help me with the civil case, but um, I will never try a 132A if I have a valid FIHA claim. Um, so next slide. Oh, I think I'm done with um, my portion of the intersection. Um, Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you so, so much. So um, now we have Nikki who will give us the employer perspective. She will discuss employer responsibilities with accommodation, the interactive process, and the common mistakes she sees with employers um, in terms of, of the um, interactive process and good faith interactive process that's required. Thank you, Nikki. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Lorena and the Beverly Hills Bar Association for inviting us to do this panel. Um, to dovetail off of my colleagues' discussions, us in the employment field often see employers come to us in one of two forms. It's either going to be an injury that occurred in the workplace, which would be a worker's comp cl um, claim that they would have, and then we would accommodate based on the needs that they have from the injury, or the person suffered a disability or suffers a disability that we would need to accommodate. In either instance, as Janet described, um, <clears throat> we will need to engage in the interactive process. So I think my colleague touched on this earlier, but the interactive process essentially is engaging in a timely good faith interactive process, which means you engage in a dialogue. It's a two part thing. It's a two person dialogue. It's not, I'm telling you, this is what you have to do or you tell me what I need to give you. Um, it would be an, an engagement of a discussion between human resources or your manager or someone above you who helps assign your tasks. Um, and you would, ex and you as an employee would discuss with them what, what you need to um, be accommodated in order, in order to effectively execute your job. Um, 
So what we often see, it's a, it's a, it's a two-step process between both parties. And one of the ways that you can do that is to review the job description with the employee, identify the essential functions of their job and see if that's something they can still carry on. If they can't, and the disability often comes in two ways. It'll either come in a very obvious way. For example, the person's hand is really injured and they are working in a factory that requires them to pry machinery open. So obviously that's very obvious and you can't actually um, tell them go and open up the machinery with the injured hand. Then there's other ways where it might not be obvious. It might be something um, involving their mental health or other forms of disabilities, in which case, if they don't want to disclose it, that's fine, but you can request documentation for them to fill out from their, from their physician or their psychologist or psychiatrist to um, afford you an opportunity to see if you can accommodate. So it is a two-part process. It's not okay to just say, come back to work and do everything and not engage. Um, and sometimes employers do that because they're not aware. Sometimes employers have counsel that tell them, okay, your employee just came back from medical leave or your employee just came back from surgery. Make sure you ask them if they need anything. And it could be as simple as that. It could be as simple as, hi, um, so-and-so, please let us know if you need anything. We're happy to discuss. And then it's incumbent on the employee to say, I actually do, my hand is hurting still. I don't think I can pry open machinery. Is there something we can do? And so in that kind of an example, you would sit down with them and say, okay, so your, you know, your hand is injured right now. I understand you can't do this, but your job requires you to, um, requires you to do that. Another aspect of your job is, for example, to move a tractor around. And so maybe you can sit in the tractor and move the tractor around with one hand. That might be a way that you can accommodate them. I'm so sorry, can we go to the next slide, please? So in this, in this slide, we're just discussing the good face interact, interactive process and what that kind of entails. Next slide, please, which I just touched on. And then these are the steps the employer could take. Like I said, there's sometimes that things that are not obvious. Um, for example, a person might be pregnant and have diabetes and they need a um, because they have to do insulin, they need vaccination, they need to go get their shot, whatever that might require. In that case, the employee would say, I need about an extra 15 minutes to administer my um, administer some insulin or, or to address my diabetes. If they don't feel comfortable saying that, they could just provide a doctor's note that says, my uh, she's under my care or he's under my care and they need additional time for lunch in order to handle their medical needs so those type of things are fine to also present as long as there's a discussion i think it all boils down to is there an honest and sincere discussion between the employee and the employer um and both parties making a sincere effort to find a workaround that works for everyone next slide please so to my point about accommodations, there isn't one specific one. It's not a one size fits all type of approach. It goes back to the whole interactive process. What are your needs? How can I help? Is it, and what are my needs and how can you work in, within this parameter? Um, some of the things that can be done are you know, transferring them to a different department, restructuring modifications of their jobs. Like I mentioned, maybe their job is to open up you know, machinery with pry bars and they can't do it because their hands are injured. So maybe you have them sitting at a desk for a month or two assisting. It can't be something that's completely different that they, and then they don't perform and then you fire them for performance issues, right? It has to be something that's within their realm of knowledge. Um, and so this is something that can be explored by both parties. Uh, you could change their job duties um, and provide them medical care, for example, in a pregnancy case, there's a lot of prenatal appointments. So engaging them in discussions of, okay, sure, what is it that you need? The employee would say, well, I have prenatal, uh, prenatal doctor visits, you know, once a week, once a month, I'm gonna have to attend, I'm sure, no problem. Um, and then if it is a problem, then really discussing what can be done about that. Um, so reassignments to vacant positions sometimes are taken up. It's not that often because vacant positions are, you know, it has to kind of be in line with what the person works. If the person does mill work and now you're having them, uh, you know, do CEO work, it's, it's, it's not apples to apples. So you want to kind of stick within the same realm. Um, 
and then of course there's like modification of equipment and whatnot. So like I, in the example of the hand injury, next slide please, where the person's hand was injured, you know, they were able to provide operating the forklift, which was something completely different from what he was doing, but within the realm of his um, essential functions of his job. Next slide, please. So then what happens once the case, once there is a case, right? So how it pans out is the person asks for accommodation of some sort, the employer gives it to them. They don't end up, it doesn't end up working out for whatever reason. And then there's a claim, one of two claims, right? There's a FIHA claim for disability discrimination that comes down the pipe, or it can be, for example, workers comp case, which is like the person injured their hand, they can't do their job. Now, now they feel like they're being discriminated against and they bring a claim. Um, so through the 132A, which is the route that they bring in for, you fired me because I brought a workers comp case. In that instance, what you see is the attorney for the applicant, this has been my experience, the attorney for the applicant will litigate the case and one of two outcomes can happen. Either they litigate and they um, settle the whole case together, including the 132A, or they kind of bifurcate the 132A claim and try and get some money through that, through that medium, as well as the workers comp case, or they litigate the, the 132A claim. So in a, in a case that we have right now, they didn't want to, pay, they, didn't, they haven't given us the demand. Um, and so the next step is to notice depositions, do some you know, requests for productions and kind of see what are the claims, the underlying claims for the 132A. In other instances, you'll see it's just they're, they're, they're litigating both cases, the workers comp and the employment case in tandem with one another. So what ends up happening a lot of times is you'll sign a resignation in the workers comp case. Well, that can be used by the defense attorneys in the FIHA play, King, uh, excuse me, case. So what ends up happening is I look at it and you're saying wrongful termination, disability discrimination. Well, you resigned. You said you were gonna resign. So now I can use that. Now it doesn't completely destroy the plaintiff's case in that matter, but it undermines the thrust of their, their position that I was wrongfully terminated because they resigned. They can bring something called constructive termination that the you know, environment was so bad that they, had to, they couldn't work there anymore. But ultimately what ends up happening is it becomes um, a claim that the defense can use. I should know in 2020, um, settlement agreements can no longer have uh, clauses where there's no rehire. Um, there is an exception, it's um, in CCP 1002.5B2, where you are not allowed to have no future rehire clauses, because that's what defense likes. If I'm gonna, if you and I, if you're resigning or you're terminated, if we're gonna settle the case, I don't want you coming back. But there is a clause that says there is a legitimate, if there is a legitimate non-discriminatory or non-retaliatory reason for terminating, the employment relationship or refusing to rehire the um, for the employment relationship coming to an end, it's okay to have that term. So I would look into that too um, for future settlement discussions with um, workers comp and FIHA claims. So I would always recommend that if there's a workers comp case going on and you're intending to bring some form of a disability discrimination or wrongful termination claim, you definitely engage in employment counsel to go through it with you. Um, and this, there's different strategies. Some people won't settle the work comp case until the employment's uh, settled or vice versa. It's to see, you have to see what works best for each, um, each case. So that's kind of my position. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. And I think we're delving into um, these questions that we're getting and perhaps Jeanette, you can also chime in and give us the plaintiff's perspective, essentially with settling the work comp claim. And we have a question here. Um, from Hugo Gamez, if employers cannot fire an employee for settling a work comp claim, why then do the employees, um, why, why then do they present to the employees paperwork resigning under a separation agreement um, as a condition to basically settle the work comp? Um, if you can speak to that, you're muted. A lot of times the requirement to sign a voluntary resignation will come from the carrier themselves, not necessarily the employer. And that's because 
if the employee settles a, a work comp injury through compromise and release, they get returned back to work and then they re-injure them, they re-injure the same body part, it entitles them to reopen a whole new case. So why is it's an incentive for the carrier to sign a voluntary resignation that ensures that the injured worker does not go back to work and refile the same claim for the same body parts. So it's, it's not a condition, it, technically it's not allowed. You don't submit it to the uh, Workers' Compensation Appeals Board for approval with the voluntary resignation. It will not get approved but it's the carrier themselves asking for that voluntary resignation and sometimes the employers, um, but it's primarily the, um, the carrier. What I typically do is I, in my cases, I will never ever have my client sign a voluntary resignation at all, um, even if there's no FEHA claim. Um, and what I will do if, when I get a voluntary resignation, I completely cross it off and um, and add my own language. So what I usually write on the on the uh, compromise and release, I mean, the separate voluntary resignation, I instead put a, an acknowledgement. As of this date, if they've already been fired or they are no longer employed, as of this date, I acknowledge I am no, I, I am, I am no longer employed. So it's not necessarily a voluntary resignation. It's just saying I'm no longer employed as of this date. So that's, that's, correct. What, that's what I typically do on all of my cases, regardless of whether we have a FIHA claim or not, even if the statute of limitations has already long gone, because a lot of times we'll settle claims, work on claims after they've been, you know, gone for four or five years. It doesn't matter. I never have them sign a voluntary resignation. Um, and hey, if, if they want a voluntary resignation, they're going to have to pay the value of of potentially a, a wrongful termination case if that's really what they want. A lot of times they won't really fight me on it, um, on, on the language, because it doesn't really matter for the insurance company. It doesn't really matter whether there is a voluntary resignation or not. Um, so, so yeah, so that's, that's, that's the reason why they will have them sign a voluntary resignation to avoid further liability for the carrier. Um, for that injured worker. So rarely will there be a return to work compromise and release. Um, some employers will have the return to work compromise and release, but only if they're under $25,000. If they're over $25,000, they will not offer the return to work compromise and release. Instead, it's a stipulated award where they get the future, um, the, where the future medical care is open. And that's because if, if they re-injure themselves, they can pretty much treat under the same claim as opposed to opening a whole new claim and providing again, permanent disability, providing again, all of the costs of litigating, et cetera. And, and then for, oh. just from a practice point on my end, um, I actually do exactly what Jeanette does. If um, I, I don't do, I don't title it as a voluntary resignation. I'm, it's always, uh, they acknowledge they're no longer employed, that it's not, I'm not, you know, I voluntarily resign. I don't put that language in there. And that's when it's never been an issue when I've, uh, when I word it that way. And I always word it that way. Another thing as a practice point, if representing injured workers, uh, confirm if the carrier is still on the risk, because like Jeanette said, the carrier wants a closed file, but, and they can get a, a closed file without having future medical care open if the carrier is no longer on the risk, meaning uh, they can go back to work, but it's a new carrier. That carrier does, the carrier that has the work comp injury doesn't care if he goes back to work, because guess what? The insurance, the insurance company who's, on, who's now on the risk, they, they're, they're no longer on the risk. They're not gonna have to pay for another injury. It's gonna be a totally new carrier. And it's not the, and if it's not the employer's money also because of the deductible, then it doesn't matter. So you wanna look at that. That's a question that I would pose to a defense attorney or do your own research and get a WCIRB to confirm who's on the risk now. And if they're not, then you have even more, uh, you know, more of an argument to say, hey, I don't need a voluntary resignation. Thank you, Liliana. We have a similar question, but um, on the uh, a slightly different, um, Jeffrey um, Bills um, is asking, is there ever a time when um, a settlement in the civil case will affect the work comp case? 
and basically the conversations that need to be had between counsel in the civil case with counsel for the work comp so that nothing affects the other. Um, the thing that I do is I, on the compromise and release, I always, if there is a FIHA case or an employment case, I always add language. Number one, I never uh, settle off the issue of discrimination, never. Never settle off the issue of wages because we don't know whether there's gonna be a wage an hour. So never ever settle that off. Um, and because, so on the compromise and release, you will have the different issues that you're settling off. One of them is 132A discrimination. The other one is wages. I never settle off those. And if there is a pending FIHA case, typically I write in the CNR, this has no effect on the FIHA case. It shouldn't, but I just to cover every single base. And then conversely, on the um, on the release on a, of an employment case, if there is a workers' compensation, you cannot release in a general release your rights to a workers' compensation case. You can't. That's just it, it, you, you can't. So if there is language on there, I've never seen it. I've never seen language. If anything, um, I will add. You know, um, the workers' compensation case ADJ number X Y Z. It's um, it's it's excluded. It's not part of this general release or something of that nature. But um, it's you have to be very very careful on the on the workers' compensation release, um, not release worker um, compromise and release to make sure that nothing in there, no language can potentially impact your your employment case. That's why if you're an employment lawyer, it's very very important to keep in contact with that workers' compensation attorney because sometimes you will have the site claims. And those can be a very, very detrimental to your employment case, to, to your employment harassment case. So you can, and I think there's another question on there, you can file a harassment case in workers' compensation because it arises out of and within the court work, um, course and scope of your employment. And you can also file the FIHA case. So nothing is limiting you from filing a, a um, let's say a sexual harassment case, right? Um, I currently have a sexual harassment case that should be going to trial in about two months. And we follow the workers' compensation case because it arose within the course and scope of their employment. And then I also filed the, um, the sexual harassment case. And um, the law says that the harassment itself was not part of the bargaining power of em employment. So that was not part of their employment um, agreement. They did not agree to be employed and be harassed. That's why you can pursue both the harassment in workers' compensation, and you can pursue the harassment in civil. So you will have the argument that they, you know, they've already been compensated, but they're not going to fly. I mean, we got past, I've gone through past MSJ on every single one of those cases, but they still, I mean, they still try to, um, to make that argument. So you, yes, you can um, have both the harassment and, um, and the harassment in civil and in workers' compensation, but you have to be very, very careful in that, um, in the workers' compensation uh, case and talk to the uh, workers' compensation attorney. The other thing that I'm usually very careful on those harassment cases, if I'm not the workers' compensation attorney, is if it's a psych harassment case and that workers' compensation takes it to trial and they lose the harassment, it was a good faith business practice or there was no harassment or then that can also have an impact on your employment case because it's gonna be res judicata. So typically if my client, if my harassment, if my employment um, client has a separate workers' compensation uh, attorney, I will typically be present at every single hearing and I will make sure that they do not try that case because sometimes the workers' compensation judges do not get it. <laughs> so you don't want that to impact your harassment case. So it's really, really important if it's a harassment case to be present at every single work comp hearing to ensure that it doesn't go to trial and to make sure that the compromise and release doesn't include any language that's going to preclude your employment case. So that's happened you know, a couple times. It happened once with one of my clients where she um, settled the work comp claim and settled everything saying that there's no additional injuries whatsoever. That's what it said. And it had a severe impact on my employment case, but that was a different workers compensation attorney. So. I think you touched on the um, work comp exclusivity rules, right? Is that, is that what you were talking about? Um, something else I've noticed, and I've talked to colleagues about this, my work comp colleagues can tell you more about it, but in the employment realm, I think 
the question was, is, is one better to settle or the other first? Um, there can be depositions in the work comp case and settlements in the work comp case that, for example, claim total disability. And then if you bring it over to the FIHA case or to the employment case, the argument would then be, well, you're telling us you're completely disabled and you cannot do your job in the work comp case. So how do you expect us to, for example, accommodate when we've told you there's no other position? Can you, for example, sit for longer periods of time at the desk and you say no? Can you pry open, you know, back to my example, pry metal objects open, you say no. So now you've kind of, for some people, it all depends on the client and, and, and your litigation style. But for some people, if they say, no, I need the money right now, let's get, let's get this wrapped up. But in other cases, sometimes waiting for one to settle and then the other to Janet's point might make more sense only because there can be arguments that are, that are discussed in the work comp case that we can cite to and say, well, now you're telling me you're partially disabled and I've offered you accommodations to do X, Y, and Z and you're telling me no, but in the work comp case, you're saying, well, you technically can. So that's, um, that's one, one part of the argument to also be mindful of when working through um, the process of settling the case, which one makes more sense to settle first versus second. Um, and I've heard of people who don't tell their plaintiff's counsel that they had a tandem work comp case going on. So that person has no idea and defense figures it out before they do and pulls depo testimonies or settlements and can cite to it and they're completely blindsided. So I think it's really critical even on the plaintiff's side um, to ask that question, have you brought a work comp case? Who's the attorney? Where are you in that process? Because that will severely impact your FIHA claims in the employment case. So, um, so really having that open dialogue is important. Thank you, Nikki. Um, Janelle, someone wanted you to clarify, you know, how harassment works in work comp. Um, is, it, is it the psych that people are bringing into the work comp claim that is part of the harassment that then they later per follow in a FIHA case? Is that, can right. you just clarify yeah. that? So the harassment would be a psych claim. Um, so, you know, as a result of either a another employee harassing them, a supervisor, or in my case, sexual harassment. So any type of harassment that occurred as a result of um, and within the course and scope of employment, that's 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 the type of harassment that I'm that I'm talking about. So oh. sexual harassment, um, even like age discrimination, any type of harassment can be brought in both because it did arise within the course and scope of employment, but you can also bring it uh, under FIHA because it's not part of the job. Um, it's, it's, you didn't bargain for to be harassed mm -hmm. uh, when you took on this job. And I think, I'm not sure if what he's asking is why would those damages be part of a work comp case? And so from a work comp perspective, the damages or the remedies that that an injured worker has are not limited, are limited. Uh, you don't get a remedy for pain and suffering in workers' compensation. Your remedy is limited to replacement of your lost wages while you're out, which is temporary disability indemnity, the value of your injury, which is your permanent disability. And so that's, uh, those are the damages you have in a if it's a straight harassment claim if you if it is found that your harassment which you know because of you were harassed you had emotional you had you had stress you had a psychological injury um, so it's found that it arose out of and occurred during the course of your employment it has a value and that's your permanent disability. So that's the remedy in work comp. That's the damages that you get in work comp, but you don't get a million dollars for emotional distress. So I don't know if that goes to the answer that Mr. The, the answer to the question that Mr. Barnes had. I hope it did also. Thank you, Ileana. So we have an interesting question from Jeffrey Najin. Um, when an injured employee returns and is accommodated to a, a position of lesser value or a sense, I guess, demoted a bit, can their compensation also be reduced? So this accommodation, I guess, when they are putting them in a position and then they, they uh, reduce their salary in turn. So because that's the only position they can accommodate the person to work at with the employer. 
It's interesting. I have a case like this going to trial right now, but okay. uh, she came back and um, her her position was reduced because it, they needed her to be in that position, but they didn't reduce the salary, which was the argument that defense is making that your salary was not reduced. Now, can they? Of course they can. Um, what's plaintiff's argument going to be? Oh, well, then now you're discriminating, right? Against this person went on disability leave and now you're demoting them. That would be the argument that plaintiffs would make. Defense would probably make the argument that in a hypothetical situation, of course, defense would make that or plaintiff would make that argument and defense would probably make the argument. That's, you know, they came back from their duty, you know, they came back, this was the only position that was comparable and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then you leave it up to the jury. <laughs> so. Thank you, Nikki. Um, there's another question about um, work comp filings and how can a civil attorney check to see if there has been one filed if maybe the client is not sure or, or whatnot? So yes, it's, it's really easy. You want, Ayana, you want to go ahead and- Oh, it's really easy. It's the electronic adjudication management system. And I'm sure I could type the link in there and it's a public search function. And you type in your client's name and their date of birth and a case will pop up if one has been filed. And that's the easiest way to find out. So let me look, I'll look for and the for link. Defense, and for defense, just ask your client. Anything. Sorry. Yeah, uh, and for for defense, your client often is already litigating it or whatnot, so they'll tell you, "Hey, we just did a depo and work comp." Okay, then give us the whole file type thing. Um, so that's how you find out. But it is a public record too. Thank you. Um, I have another here. Um, if the employee retires while the work comp case is in process, is this considered a voluntary resignation? No, it's not. You don't have a voluntary resignation there. If they are, if, if they retired, um, they're retired. However, you will see the argument if there's a FIHA case, you will see the argument that there's no economic damages because they would have retired anyway. So it's kind of that those, you know, you're kind of in a in a in an interesting position because their defense and Nikki can talk about that. They will argue that they would have retired anyways. Absolutely. Um, but you still have your emotional distress if there's emotional distress damages on there. So, but Nikki can probably uh, yeah. address that a little more. Yeah, so it, it, it's not a termination and it's a resignation. You do it on your own volition. So there would be the argument that there is no wrongful term here. There's resignation in terms of damages, you know, in a way, in a hypothetical sense, you are cutting your damages. Um, by a lot <laughs> because the way it normally works is you would calculate you know had they been in this position for this much longer and whatnot how much they could have accrued so you're, you're in essence telling us that you're done working um so thank, thank you nikki and we're um getting towards the end um and we have still have a few questions we couldn't get to um if the panelists can put their emails in the chat i think um, maybe you can reach to them directly if you have a specific question you you need answered um, you just have to chat to everyone um, and, and then we can try to answer everybody's questions. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us and a big thanks to the panelists. Thank you for your time and education. And thank you to the labor and employment section of the Beverly Hills Bar for always bringing us these important programs. We have another important panel coming up on July 14th to discuss PAGA and the Viking River Cruise case, um, the latest US Supreme Court decision on that, and you don't want to miss it. Thank you, everyone, um, for joining us, and everyone have a great day. Thank you, Lorena. Thank, Thank you. you.